All right, we're going to get started. Um, hello, uh, welcome to CORD, and welcome to the very first talk of the meeting. I'm Dr. Anamika Atama. I'm the Clerkship Director at Boston University School of Medicine and Boston Medical Center. Um, and I'd like to introduce my co-presenters. Uh, this is Dr. Raul Patwari. He's Dean at Rush University Medical School. And Dr. Sharon Board, she is clerk, Associate Clerkship Director at Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, just to get it out of the way, none of us have any disclosures for this talk. Um, so this talk is going to be an overview of the on latest online resources, apps, and podcasts available for medical students who are rotating uh, through your clerkship, um, really at any level. So those that are just coming for uh, just for the month, those that are pursuing a career in emergency medicine. And it's also going to be um, for you guys, the clerkship directors that are involved in their education. Um, we're hoping to provide a list of helpful resources educators can tell their students about to be used for studying and for clinical practice. Uh, we, came, we came up with this talk because as veteran clerkship directors, we were very used to kind of answering the typical questions like, where do I go? Um, how do I log into the system? Uh, who do I present to? Um, what do I wear? Who do I ask to write my slow? And, you know, after being a clerkship director for a short period of time, I think we can all answer all these questions pretty well. Um, but at least for me, when I was asked the question, like, what are good kind of online resources for me to use during my month here, I never really felt like I had a great answer. Um, and so this talk was put together so that you guys um, will have an answer to exactly that question when it inevitably gets asked. Um, this talk's also going to fit very well into the next talk, which is going to be about how to incorporate uh, free open access medical education materials and online resources into your clerkship. Um, so you can think of this as your cooking class for the next hour. Um, we are going to provide you with the ingre all the ingredients you need in order to serve up the best clerkship experience uh, for your students. So let's begin. Okay, so we're going to begin with an overview of podcasts. So what is a podcast? Okay, this is a form of audio broadcasting on the Internet. Um, the term comes from combining the words broadcasting and iPod, uh, from which most podcasts were originally downloaded. Uh, you subscribe to podcasts much like you subscribe to blogs, but you can also download single episodes if that's what you want to do. And this allows for access to specific and ongoing content, such as relevant topics in emergency medicine. So why use podcasts? Um, I think there are a lot of good reasons to use podcasts. One is that it's an alternative form of learning. So learners today expect that they're going to get their material from a lot of different sources. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, you can get lectures from some of the best, um, best speakers and best teachers in the world. Um, anytime you want. This has the advantage of providing high caliber information and, in do, and doing so in a style that educators may emulate. Um, podcasts increase opportunities for learning because they can be used at times when you would otherwise not be learning. So travel, going to the gym, commuting. Um, I personally use podcasts when I'm preparing dinner and washing the dishes. I mean, because let's face it, who really has time just to sit down and read anymore? Um, Given the varying lengths of podcasts and the ability to pause them if needed, you can tailor learning to the amount of time you have available at any given moment. Um, many of the podcasts are in short format and really don't require a large time commitment. Um, and also, when you do listen to podcasts, I encourage you to listen to the podcasts that you would recommend to your students. Um, because that way you become familiar with the content and how it, um, and how it's presented. And who knows, you may just learn something yourself. So everybody knows about EM Crit. I feel like this is the podcast that most of my residents uh, talk about when you ask them about podcasts or that they refer to on Shift. Um, this is one of the most well-known podcasts. It has excellent content. Um, but its focus is on critical care. And the content really is too advanced for most medical students. So I'd like to talk to you about podcasts other than EM Crit. So um, 
Emergency medicine physicians ha are often at the forefront of medicine and medical education. And as a result, there are a lot of excellent podcasts to choose from. This is just a selection of a few of them. Um, a lot of these um, are have specific focuses, as you can see, like pediatrics, ultrasound, toxicology, critical care. But again, a lot of the content for these is a little too advanced for medical students, for most medical students. Um, so there are some that are specifically for the beginning learner. Um, and I, in an attempt to simplify, I've narrowed it down um, to a list of um, three podcasts that I'm going to recommend. So this is Emergency Medicine for Students, EM Basic, and EM Stud. Um, now, this is not to exclude other great podcasts out there. Um, there are many, and some of you may even have some of your own. Um, and at the end, at the Q&A section, I would encourage any of you to share any of the, that you may have. Um, we can post these to the CORD li listserv. Um, or, um, like our new generation of learners, uh, you can tweet them out at uh, hashtag CORDAA17 if you want to. Um, but I feel like this is a good list of basic kind of menu options uh, to start with. So I'm going to talk briefly about each of these. So first, emergency medicine for students. This podcast is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, the podcast is made by Dr. Zach Olson, and the purpose of the podcast is to help medical students on their emergency medicine clerkship. The content covers different chief complaints, critical diagnoses, and skills in, important for the clerkship. Um, so some example topics that I just picked out that have been posted recently are sore throat, constipation, marathons, DKA, narcotics, and the basics of laceration repair. Um, they consist of short kind of 10-minute episodes as well as kind of a little bit longer 30-minute bolus interviews. Um, and the short, uh, the short format can be valuable because it can fit high-yield information into a busy schedule. And this is also appropriate for both third- and fourth-year rotators. And then EM Basic. Uh, this is made by Dr. Steve Carroll. It's made for medical students and emergency medicine interns to review common chief complaints and, um, in emergency medicine from the ground up. And it really does exactly that. It's very clear explanations of complaints that you are going to see in the emergency department. Um, recent topics on this one uh, include hyperthermia, thyroid emergencies, croup, aortic dissection, non-pregnant vaginal bleeding, and febrile seizure. And uh, episodes are approximately 30 minutes long. And last of all is EM Stud. This is the CDOM podcast. It's made by Dr. Nate and Dr. Scott. Topics include applying to EM, the EM clerkship, and some basic medical content. I think that this podcast will also be useful for beginning clerkship directors because it covers a lot of the content that's often gone over in advising meetings. And when I was listening to it, I really thought, oh, yeah, this is stuff I tell my students all the time. This is good to know, and it's good to know that other people are thinking the same way and approaching things the, the same way that I am. Um, so that's an overview of, um, of some of the podcasts, um, some ideas of things you can tell your students when they ask you about it. Um, and now you're going to be taken to the next station, section by Dr. Pogwari. Okay. Right, so I was going to go over some apps uh, that uh, students could use on a shift. And the way that I came up with this list is to go through uh, a couple of different sites. Not the apps that I would use, but the apps that students are using. And so studentdoctor.net, I went to that site, iMedical Apps, and a whole bunch of other ones. And we did a survey of our students and said, which are the ones that you find the most useful? When looking at these apps, though, these are the ones that I think came up at the top of the mo of most of the lists. Uh, there's a couple of things I think that are important that with when looking at these apps. And the first thing is the price, because the price makes a difference. And in this, the way that we look at apps now, anything more than 99 cents is considered expensive, right? And so you can see most of them are free, but there's one there that's $54, so that's kind of pricey. Uh, but the rest of them are fairly cheap. But I think the one that's more important is when was it last updated? Uh, because some of them were, you can see one is from 2011, 2013. Uh, they tend not to get updated that often. 
Uh, that may or may not be a problem because some of the content is evergreen content, right? A broken bone is a broken bone in 2011 as it is now, but some content does change, like, you know, the way that we manage sepsis. So that's something to take into account. And so the first column there is, you know, what the, is the name of the thing, then the second column was the price, and then that last one was the time that it was last updated. So the top three that I found on these sites I'm going to go over. And the first one, it's really not an app, but it, people will use it on their phone. And it's this pocket book, uh, Pocket Emergency Medicine. And it's that same book that we used to keep in our white coats, because, and it was designed specifically for that. But I think that format works really well on the long, thin uh, phone screens as well, as you can see here. And it's really just a book that is designed at a student level, and it's very easy to access because you could click on any of these blue uh, blue words there, and it'll send you to the, to the chapter. Uh, so students can, on a shift, uh, look these things up, and then come up with their management plans, come up with the diagnostic tests that they want to order. And a lot of students find this one useful. It is $55 because it's a Kindle book. Uh, and in the app that it is, it's the Kindle app. But I think it, it, actually, it actually does what it's supposed to do. The next one is another old one, but a good, an oldie but a goodie. It's made by Emra. It's, again, a pocketbook. It's based on the, the EM Basics pocketbook. Uh, and it's, uh, they just converted it to an app. And, again, you can see it's very chief complaints-based. And so on this first page here, you can see it says headache, head injury, sore throat, cough. You click on one of those things, you press on headache, and it sends you to all these various pages here that students can go through from what should you be asking on history, what should you be looking on physical, and what kind of tests should you order. And you can see they've even got like an illness script table over there, which is uh, stratified by the dan dangerous diagnosis, most common diagnosis, and zebra diagnoses. And so, again, all these apps are really meant to do is to make your students look good so that when they come to present, they've at least thought about the things that we want them to think about. And so it's a crutch. So this one is, is really good at that. It does. When I, I loaded it up, it says, you know, right when it comes up, it needs to be updated, and it may not uh, work with future versions of iOS. I think that if, when it finally breaks, they will update it. I just bring that up there because, you know, these, some of these apps are old and may not work in the future. All right. And then the last one I was going to talk about was an oldie, but it was a good one that we always do, which is MD Calc, which I think a lot of students find useful. Because you might ask a student, you know, did you perk this patient? They're like, yes. And they have no idea what that means. But if they have the app, you can say, well, why don't you go pull up the MD Calc app, and I want you to check it out. And, and make sure you ask all of these questions for anyone who comes in with a PE and see if they meet these criteria. And it's a good way to teach them to be a little bit more self-reliant. So these these three apps here, the uh the Pocketbook from Emergency Medicine, the EM Basics from EMRA, and MD Calc are the top three ones that are on all our polls that students found most useful while working on a shift. And next is up is Sharon. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I just want to make sure... Oh, thank you. Everyone is awake. So by a show of hands, uh, how many people went to medical school in an age where you had to have your pockets full of stuff. Raise your hand. So almost everyone. I actually, when I was a medical student, I'd be like, my neck always hurts. So I decided to weigh myself on one of those big scales with my white coat on and with my white coat off. And literally my white coat weighed 20 pounds. Did anyone else do this experiment? <laughs> and I tell students all the time how lucky they are that they go to medical school in an age where they don't have to walk around with a white coat weighing 20 pounds, right? You put your iPhone in your pocket, or maybe you have a little iPad mini, and you're able to have access to all of these wonderful resources, not to mention the fact that you can just go sit down in front of a computer and have access to so much information. So I have the pleasure of talking about good old websites. Uh, here is one of the original Mac computers, and fast forward to the laptop computer, which I see many of you sitting, uh, sitting behind right now. So the app that, the website that was most cited by students, so all of us did a little informal poll of our students, and my students who I asked said that the thing that they use most is up to date. How many of you want a shift to go on to up to date? Pretty much everyone, right? This is something that we all use. So something that's good for us, uh, and also really good for our students. This is good for basic knowledge, uh, as well as more advanced, uh, treatment information. And, I think that this is a wonderful resource for students. Now, the good thing about it is that if you are at a major institution, this is paid for by the institution. The bad thing is that if this is something you want to access from home or get access to from another site or potentially a place that doesn't have a subscription, this is actually really, really pricey. 
I actually sort of tried to price it out online, and it was hard to even discern kind of how much it costs. Um, but I think it's probably somewhere along the lines of hundreds, potentially thousands of dollars for you to have access to this uh, individually. The next thing to discuss is the new CDEM curriculum. Now, this is something that many of us in this room have put our blood, sweat, tears, time into, and something that I think we're all really, really proud of. Within the CDEM curriculum, um, there is an M3 curriculum as well as a more advanced M4 curriculum. So again, this really is something that can be utilized by a majority of students who are rotating in the emergency department, from a basic clerkship student all the way to a sub-intern. Uh, and this is divided into different uh, content topics and provides some good basic information for those students. And these are just three other additional websites that I want to make sure that we highlight. One of them is Life in the Fast Lane. And I think this is really good for EKG information. I will use this website for teaching purposes for myself. So if I'm looking for an EKG of something, I'll go ahead and uh, pull up Life in the Fast Lane. Uh, if you're not sure about a certain EKG finding, I'll go ahead and, and look on Life in the Fast Lane. And I think this is a great reference for students for EKGs, but also there's a lot of other content material on there. Uh, Life in the Fast Lane is something that I think is really great for, um, for all of us in emergency medicine where they review a lot of the foam information every week, and they put that on there as well. So I think that Life in the Fast Lane is a great website to advise students to if they want some of that uh, EKG teaching. I think it really presents it in a way that they can understand. The next thing to talk about is EM Basic. EM Basic is a good review uh, review website, and Dr. Uh, Atama talked about it as a podcast. So what they basically do with their podcast is they take their podcast and they break it down into a document that can be read, so students can access it in multiple different ways. And the last thing is academic life and emergency medicine. I think this is good for hot topics. So for your more advanced emergency medicine student who um, wants to look up some up-to-date information within uh, the Internet, so I think that that's what uh, academic life and emergency medicine is good for. And, of course, there's always Dr. Google. <laughs> so when in doubt, if you can't find something that you're looking for, you can go ahead and look in Google. We were talking last night about the fact that Google Scholar is actually a really good re resource for uh, for students. And Rahul, when uh, he goes into it, says that it's very easy to find uh, articles that were cited within these articles. So it can be helpful for students if they're going ahead and doing some research on different topics or even for, uh, for residents and potentially faculty for teaching purposes. Now, Googling your symptoms when you don't feel well is the most efficient way to convince yourself you're dying. <laughs> I definitely, you know, even as a physician, been stuck in that trap a few times. Uh, but I think that Google is great, but also has some pitfalls about it, right? Because sometimes you never know exactly how accurate the information that you're accessing is. So when your students are going and just Googling stuff, you want to make sure that they're take, keeping that in mind. So thank you so much for your time and attention this morning. Uh, we provided you with the ingredients uh, to give to your students, and Dara and Scott are going to go ahead and um, and provide you with an additional cooking class to, to keep things going. <laughs> Um, if anyone hasn't, it would help for our talk. Yes. Oh, for them? I think we're done. Sorry, we didn't answer. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> questions and answers. Yes, go ahead. You want to go around? I'll use it mostly as a discussion point because the 
best answer. I don't know that there is a best answer, though. Usually, you know, my favorite answer to that question is from the first episode of Scrubs, which is you take a handful of Tylenol, you open their mouth, you throw it at them. Whatever lands in their mouth, that's the right dose. Uh, but I think it's really about empowering the student to go and find information. But it's more than that, because before it was you just go there and find and find information, but now you get an, an, a huge avalanche of information, and you need to be able to... Uh, teach them the skills to curate that. That's more than what we're talking about in this talk. That is a special set of skills that we do need to teach students, which is uh, how do you find what is of quality and what's not of quality. And there are actually some resources out there that I can we can perhaps put up on uh, Twitter. Okay. So as we all know, medical students are, are motivated by the test. And what I find most of my students really want to know is whether it's going to the exam or Um, I think, can you hear me through this? So I always tell students the best way to study for the test is basically do the test, just do questions. Questions, 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 and then you'll know how to answer the questions. And I think hands down, that is exactly the way to do that. I advise students time and time again, you know, unfortunately, and to be totally blunt, like I just kind of say, for you're going to do two different things. You're going to study for the test, and then you're going to learn how to function in the emergency department. Studying for the test, do the test, do the questions. Okay, functioning well in the emergency department, you need to actually read um, and you know the the resources that we gave you today um, really do cover the majority of the basic complaints um, that will be seen, and and they're very applicable to practice. Um, and so to do well and perform well in the emergency department, um, those are the ones I would refer them to. But, I mean, for the test itself, it's just questions. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I definitely, um, I definitely agree with that. I think that they're definitely, you know, for us also in our practice, right, they're studying for the uh, for the exam, and then there's also how we practice. I think that, again, CEDEM curriculum, I think, is is a good basic resource, and I think the EM Basic also does a good topic review uh, and is generally pretty up-to-date on those topics. So I think that's another thing that can help them prepare for, for an exam. I'm going to put that question on Twitter, and it's going to be under CEDEM faculty. If you guys are on Twitter, you can, you can find it there with the uh, court hashtag, and maybe everyone else can supply their answers, too. Go Twitter. <laughs> Any other questions before we pass it off? All right, great. Thanks so much for your time. Excellent, Doug. All right, so now, like we said, uh, we're going to go next. Uh, if anyone, like us, is everyone on the Wi-Fi? Fantastic. Hi. Okay, so we're going to start, and we will introduce ourselves along the way. Yes. It's Chord 17. It's hard to figure. No, it's good. So Chord 17, all capitals. Um, everyone should be able to get on, and we want to crash the Internet from here as opposed to anywhere else. All right, great. Uh, okay, so let's start. So uh, the team just before us gave you guys all the ingredients to have great education in your clerkships and to use a lot of the, opportunity, the media available. And so what we're going to say is, so you kind of all put it in a pot. How many people here have ever used a crock pot or an Instapot? Right, so you just kind of throw it all in, cover it, leave it, and good food comes out, right? And that's not how education works, right? So we can't just take all the resources we just learned about and put them in a pot because medical students are not really like a stew. They're more like a souffle, right? And so if you don't put the right ingredients in with the right time and if you don't bake it comfortably, it falls. So really, we're going to cook. Scott and I prefer to get baked, but that's a different story. Laugh. That was like our big joke, like our big joke, right? So ultimately, we're going to get big together, and so now we are going to yeah. get prepared. Hold on. You 
Okay. Okay, so I'm Scott Weeders, and I'm from Texas A&M, and Baylor Scott White Hospital, deep in the heart of Texas, and thank you so much, Dara, for introducing us. Yeah, I'm Dara Cass from New York. She needs no introduction. I try not. So we're going to be cooking up some content today, and we're going to give you the cookbook on how to take the great ingredients that we just learned about and then put them into a masterpiece. We do not have conflicts of interest. As you can tell, we work on a shoestring budget here, Amazon looking for some good Prime. deals. Quickly, our objectives, we've got three main points we're going to take you home with. We're going to talk about how to really incorporate technology and social media into your clerkship. We're going to show you how it's very easy to create free open access medical education. It's not as hard as you think. We're also going to talk about engaging our learners beyond the classroom, outside of the walls of our institution, because that's really where learning is going to take place. You see, we've got just a small amount of time that we spend in our sessions, in our simulations, and in the department, but there's so much more. There's reading that the students are going to be doing, and they, they love the books. We talked about the resources they like. They're going to be watching videos. They're going to be listening to the podcast. They're going to be taking a look at the websites that we just saw. And then they're going to be engaging each other. They're going to talk about what the best website is, and they're going to talk about the case that they just saw in the emergency department using social media which is their form of communication. So how do we get inside their heads? How do we do this? Well, we understand that podcasts are the chosen medium for millennials. This is a published study. Millennials, how do you like to learn in emergency medicine residencies? Podcasts dominate. This is where people want to go to get their resources. So we need to meet them where they like to get their resources. They do like the textbooks a little bit. In our beloved journals, they fall right behind Google. That's how valuable millennials view academic journals. So now we're going to ask you to take out your phones, right? So unlike any lecture that you've had in medical school, we're going to ask you to incorporate technology and pick up your phones right now. Okay. You have to click this guy. So. All right. Next thing you're going to do is you're going to text to 37607 leaders. So we want you to put that in right now. Okay. After that, we'll have your social security number. Okay, sorry. Well, it's on there, right? So 37607 on the top. That's the number you're going to be texting to. And then you put weeders in the con in the text comment. Your message will messaging. be weeders, yeah. And then as soon as you're ready, please answer this question, which is, how excited are you for this talk? Mm. Seriously? I love it. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Wow, the explode and smiles. I like people. Nice. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So you guys are about to explode. That's wonderful. So now, the first thing we're going to do, if you kind of go back to our original cooking analogy, is we're going to break it up into three components. And the first one is kind of the meat of the talk, right? This is the highest nutritional value. This is the part you want to concentrate on. This is the filet, right, of our talk. Scott changed this meat picture like three times when you're preparing because he has so many different <laughs> kinds of meat that he enjoys cooking because he's in Texas. So here we go, Scott. All right, so let's talk about this. What do you use right now currently in your clerkship? You may vote more than once, so just put in the letters for what you're currently using in your clerkship. Hopefully you're using a lot of different things here, but let's see. Text in your answers. Okay, so a lot of simulation we're seeing, a lot of case presentations, good active learning. Okay, NVMe. What are the three others, real quick? What? Anyone? Okay, good. Simulation, suture labs, things like that. Great, great. Nice, nice. How do you use that? Brilliant. Yeah, for those that might not have heard, as students tweet out a learning point from their shift, this is great. That is the exact thing we're getting at here. Okay. Yammer, great. Perfect. 
Free text in. Whatever you type in is going to show up. I'm watching you, Tyson Pillow. Be careful. How do you guys use technology in your clerkship? I think Yammer's great. That's perfect. Talked about tweeting. Discussion forums. Okay. Nice. Boards. Somebody uses me in their clerkship. That's generous of you. Carefully. I like yes. that one. <laughs> Boards. Flip. Oh, it's starting to build here. Do you guys know there's a word cloud, right? So the more something appears, the bigger it is. Doing your own presentation? Yeah. Because they, we can Right, we, we checked on things. Thank Check you for checking with us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so do you want to record it? We, we've got it taken care of. Thank you. Oh. All right, how do you use social media in your clerkships? Let's talk about that. How do you use social media? We heard already we have some Yammer users. We have Twitter tweeting out some tweets. Anybody else using Wiki EM? I think we're still getting some leftovers from the last. All right, so this is how I like to use it, and through the sourcing we've got on Twitter, we have found a few different things. What I like to do is I will send out and prescribe to the students beforehand a learning module that then they will teach the classroom. Now, who's had trouble with prescribing something to students and show up and nobody reads it? Yeah. Studies would say about 25% of the students do that every time, which is dismal. But what I've done is I've given them these resources and I've said, look, you're going to be responsible for teaching your classmates. It's not just you're going to be called on during class, but this is all up to you. And so what they're going to do is they go and they check out some great Fomex websites. They check out some good resources. I'll give them like an ultrasound podcast with Mike and Matt. And then they're going to be in class, and they're going to be responsible for teaching. Now, I'm the teacher in this situation. I'm taking the picture. I'm removed from the conversation, except that I just guide the conversation that's already happening with the students. And when the pressure is put on them to teach their learners and their class and in front of their, their instructors – a high percentage of the students will actually do the reading ahead of time. And I found that that's the perfect bait to get them to do the job I want them to do. At the end, I've asked them to create an NVMe level question. So now they're formulating questions. They're at the top of Bloom's taxonomy for creating content. And they create an NVMe level question. And when they have to do that, they really discover how little they know the topic. What do we do with these questions? Well, we play games. Anybody play games in their clerkship? Gamification is an, a great way to engage learners. So we take the Makey Makey, which you can connect this to a couple of clips, and you can take bananas and make them sensors, and you can play some nice games. So we've loaded this up with a lot of different, not only our clerkship, but in a lot of other clerkships in the first and second year, and the students get completely jazzed about this. They're in there competing against each other. It's low stakes. Nobody's getting graded on this, but it's fun. They love it, and the feedback is overwhelming that this is the most enjoyable part of their educational experience when we get to play games against each other. Now, we're going to play a game right now. If anybody played Cahoots, all right, tomorrow there's another topic on Cahoots, but we're going to go to Cahoots.it. It's on. It's, it's, it's here. Did you? Oh. Yeah. Hold on. I think we'll it's inside. What? Got a technical difficulty here. Oh, Let's see. It's not Let's see if we can slide over. What? I did. It's here. Okay. So how does it um, So you got to check out Kahoot's. We're having a technical difficulty, but you can actually take and create your own questions and then gamify it, playing a few different games with each other. And you can interact with your cell phones. It takes three seconds to hook up. but well, I want to do it, so I'm going to make it happen. Yeah, we'll Hold try on. it here. So go to Kahoot.it, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T, on your browser. What do you want? I want to go to the display. We have a minute to make this work. Okay. Making it work. So go to kahoot.it, K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T. All right, now I'm messing things up. That's not good. Yeah, just go to the I'm here. Chrome. The Chrome? Okay, let's yeah, go to Chrome. Chrome. Okay, hold on. Okay, go to Chrome. All right. And so what I'll do is I'll take, okay, so here you go. It'll ask you to enter in. So go ahead if you're at kahoot.it. You can enter in that pin, 
It'll ask you for making a name. We've got three players starting. All right, here we go. 20 players. We're getting some numbers here. I love it. Everybody got a game pin? Last few seconds. Wow, 50 people. All right, here we go. So this is going to be a test on Florida as a state, testing your Florida knowledge. Are you ready? Go to full screen, maybe. Huh? All right, what's the capital for? Watch your phones. Uh. This is the most popular uh, chord lecture I've ever had, by the way, by the numbers. <laughs> so I'm pretty impressed. So the learners can actually make their own questions, and then you can play this in your classroom, and you get a repository. It's kind of like your own cheap Rosh review. Okay. All right, let's do the next question. Let's see how this goes. Oh. Oh, there we go. Which is not a public. Oh, great. So you get time based on your rapid response and then also correct answers. You get a couple of different points. And again, we use this in low stakes gaming, and the students really respond to this. It's fun, it's interactive, and you can talk through and do some different cases. So we'll do maybe one more question, and then we'll kind of move on. I think you guys get the hang of this. Dave Baby's is winning. Well. Oh my God, look how fast you guys are answering. <laughs> I am really, wait, the best part is watching the answer though. Hold on. It's worth waiting for. Uh, uh huh. That's the best part, right? Everybody gets it wrong. Come on. Okay. So now. All right. So if you enjoyed Cahoots, there are some people doing the next level of gaming. I loved Galaga when I was a kid. Anybody from the 80s a Galaga fan? Yeah, completely. So you can actually shoot the right answer here and play Galaga and do USMLE based questions on this Scrub Wars. You even get a snarking attending to give you insults. I mean, this is a fun game to play. This costs money. I don't get money from these people. But these are the next level of gaming that we might contribute in our clerkships. All right, flashcards. Flashcards are a powerful way to learn. We underestimate the power of a good flashcard system. Quizlet allows you to make your own flashcards and then share your flashcard decks with others. So you can make medical flashcards. This is a cardiology learning module on Quizlet. Quizlet also lets you do a couple of different games. So I think if you could interact with using games in your clerkship, I think you're going to find a better interaction. So next, I've given you the meat. Let's go ahead and complement that with some wonderful, healthy, good vegetables for our clerkship, Dara. I love being the vegetable lady, right? Okay, so uh, now that we've kind of started with the big stuff, and more importantly, the highest technical difficulty part of our lecture, and that's done, <laughs> thank God. So now we can go to the other stuff. So the next question we want to know from you guys is... Get your text Stop. out. Please make sure it works. Uh, yay! Okay, good. Uh, have you guys ever participated in a podcast? Is that the question? Um, okay. So a lot of opportunities. Okay. Okay, so two-thirds of you have not, and one-third of you guys have. So Steve Carroll of Ian Basic has walked in the room. Everyone just, Steve, can you raise your hand? Moment of silence for Steve. <laughs> okay. He got a huge shout out to the, 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 um, talk before. So if anyone has any questions about Ian Basic, you can go over and find him. Uh, and the next question. Has anyone ever created a medical video? And this is a medical video on a medical procedure for public consumption, right? So YouTube, a procedure video, anything like that. So it's about half. Got some good actors. Right, there. exactly. And uh, the last one, has anyone ever contributed to writing a medical blog article? So this can be con yes? cool. content generation. Okay, It can even be commenting. right? So somebody writes an article on vitamin C and sepsis, and then there's about a 1,000 comments, one of you guys in the room. Right? Okay. So the cool part about being part of the open access conversation on education is how we can take it to learners, especially junior learners. So do any of these, it, so this is an infographic. Has anyone seen this particular infographic before? Raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, so has anyone heard of SMAP? Raise your hand if you've heard of SMAP. 
Right. So SMAC is a social media and critical care conference. happens internationally. This year it's in Germany during the week of my daughter's sleepaway camp, so I won't be going. But one of the things they do, which is very cool, is they have something called SMAC Junior, which is their kind of lower-level learner competition. And this actually is a way to get a ticket to a really high-stakes conference. So they say to the learners, listen to the, the podcast from last year, and then create an infographic on what you learn, submit it, and we will accept the best infographic and give you a ticket to next year's conference. So this was a, uh, a lecture given by Haney Malamut, one of our own, right, on PEA. And so it was the PEA paradox, and a medical student won smack fight and created an infographic about what Haney had taught the student during their lecture, during this lecture, right? Now think about how asynchronous this is. The, con- the lecture happened in June of last year. The infographic won in April of this year. The student may or may not have even been at the conference, and now they've created a learning modality that's disseminated on Twitter, right, for the entire world to see, which may then create new knowledge translation, all right? So we can do this ourselves in our clerkships. So this is actually from one of Scott's clerkships where the same thing happens. A case presentation happens in real time. Students create an infographic, which is super easy, right? Picto chart is free, okay? And you can just take a, a template, and I don't have any stock in Picto chart, although I think it's awesome. Uh, it's pictochart.com, P-I-K-T-O-C-H-A-R-T. Okay, you can go pro if you want. Um, but it's a great way to plug and play and to make things very visual. These are visual learners. They enjoy seeing things, okay? So you create an an infographic, and then you, as the clerkship director or the program director, whoever you are, can then tweet it out for people to consume, and you've now created foam. Now, you haven't really created the foam. Your students have done it. They've learned by creating. You're facilitating conversation by being the, uh, like the, the conductor of the education, Right? How else can you do this? These are low stakes ways that you can help facilitate these conversations in the kind of after the fact sphere. So anyone recognize this? Raise your hand if you know what this is. Somebody tell me. So this is a mom of two is whiteboard learning, right? So now what does he do? Every shift, right? Literally every shift, it's amazing. Has a whiteboard, he goes to every patient in the ER and he thinks of one learning, one learning point about each patient. Half the time his overnight shifts are three or four different reasons to take care of a drunk patient. Like, anyone notice the trends? So um, he goes through each room, and he thinks of one pearl of each patient, right? Now, getting a whiteboard into your clinical area isn't always easy, so here are post-it pearls, right? I do this, and I am not, like, it's depending on which area I'm in. These are swamis, and so every time I come to work, I find post-its everywhere in our ER, knowing which shifts he worked before me. And it's fantastic, because the students love it, it's like free to do. And then once you've done it in real time, it's, and it really helps you teach these very small because you can only fit so much information on a post-it. So it requires you to be kind of terse in your knowledge and specific in your pearls. Okay? And so if you want to know how to, how these post-it pearls have been disseminated, well then Swami takes the post-it pearls that he does in real time in the clinical area. He takes a picture of it for Twitter. Right? And so a lot of people, if you search the hashtag post it pearls, you'll find post it pearls from all over the country. Right? And it's great because you could even do a session on post it pearls where you use that as your kind of tool for conversation. He then takes a post it pearl every so often and he writes a blog post about it. Right? So here the patients were in real time. The knowledge happened in the ER. He then tweeted about it after the fact and he wrote a blog article about it. And then people can comment on it. Right? So the, the, figuring out where the content comes from, which a lot of times is the limitation in this kind of creating foam area, the patients are always there. Right? That's the part we're good at. So now we're just thinking of low, um, low stress ways to get it out there. Right? The other thing you can do with blog writing, if you have a, de- how many people have a departmental blog here? How many people have a personal blog? Mine's a little different, but still. So, Here's the Core EM blog. So Core EM is um, the NYU Bellevue uh, very kind of fundamental emergency medicine blog. And one of the things we offer our medical students, where's Hillary? She's in here, I thought. Hillary Fairbrother, who's our outgoing clerkship director. She um, 
this was a medical student we had on our rotation who wanted to write about her experience in the ER. And so she contributed to our blog, which was super interesting. Ironically, she didn't even go into emergency medicine. She went into psychiatry, right? So we have learners from different, it doesn't have to be only the students that want to go into EM that contribute to the conversation you're having on your rotation. And the best part is we're leading the charge on this. So when they come to our rotations and they see how engaging and innovative we are, they take that to the rest of the School of Medicine. And as clerkship directors, you guys have the opportunity to disseminate how cutting edge we are here in emergency medicine and how we can lead the way for the rest of the departments in your medical schools. Okay? So now that we have our meat and our vegetables, we're going to add some spice, right? So these are the little other things that make it taste better. Thank you, Darren. All right, so if you're not into Twitter yet, by the way, how many people are on Twitter for the purposes of medical education? Real high, real high. That's fantastic. Way to go. If you're not, you can see that you're, most of your colleagues are, so you might consider getting involved. If you are not involved in free open access medical education, you're not involved in the conversation, we've dialogued with a few people and tried to find maybe where's a good starting point for emergency medicine clerkship directors and students. Who should you direct your students to? And we found these 10 people. There's five here and there's five next. So we talked about Corey M. You're going to hear a lot about ALM if you've never heard of them before. They've got a lot going on. There's a large membership of ALM. It's a huge organization. Foamcast, Lauren Westerfer and Jeremy Faust. They do kind of sound bites for medical education. Smack Junior, again, the medical student version of Smack, I would say. And then Crackcast is a Canadian web uh, podcast, I guess, that does core content for. Yeah, the so these are, these are like kind of institutional accounts, right? So these yeah. aren't really individuals. They're more like groups that have come together. So the content is generated by different people each time, right? So you may have four or five different people generating content, which gives it some variety of flavor. And um, these are kind of the big global basic ones, whereas the next five, are people. These are more individuals. So these are individuals we feel like tweet out things that medical students would be very interested in as far as learning and content. And so you can see Celine Rezai here with Rebel EM. Um, I don't know, Alia. I don't either. We actually didn't create this ourselves. Yeah. We did a Twitter <laughs> poll, to be honest. And we asked the people on the ground, so the medical students yeah. that are on Twitter a fair amount, who do they follow for their influence? So um, three of these are actually medical students themselves. Sassy right? is. Real yeah, medical. Alia, medical, and then, um, and these three. right, so, and I don't know them in real life. In fact, I don't even know where they live. I am not even sure if Little Medic is a man or a woman. Anyone yeah. know? Um, but I know what they, they put on Twitter, and it's actually good core content. Uh, and that's actually super interesting, because they, they are, they have fan bases, uh, and thousands and thousands of followers. Yeah. And then, of course, Steve, who's in the room. Who we keep shouting out to. Yep, follow Ian Basic. This is a cool article. This is an article that was just published a few weeks ago in Academic Emergency Medicine, I believe, and Jeff Riddell published this, and Jeff went and looked at using some alometrics and influences, and I don't know how he came to the exact conclusion, but he found if you're starting off in Twitter, these are the most, I think, 50 most powerful influencers in emergency medicine that you might consider looking at. And again, this is a published article that's out in the academic literature that you can reference and get a more comprehensive list. Salim Rezai just posted a, uh, I guess it's a page of special followers for this cohort of Twitter users. So you can go to Salim's list and find that and go ahead and subscribe. He actually created a Twitter account, and I can't remember which it is, that says like it's like basic EM knowledge or fundamental EM followers. If you go to Salim's account or even uh, ping him on Twitter, he'll, he might even be here, uh, you can find out. The thing about this list is it was generated because like all good, you know, academic research in journals, Right? So this list actually capped out at users that were registered before 2014. So this list is, I would say, dated insofar as a lot of people have come up after this was generated. But it's a great place to start, all right, especially for yourselves if you're collecting your own list and then you're going to recommend to your medical students and your residents. You can go here. And, it's, it's you know, Twitter is a great place to start as a voyeur, for lack of a better term, where you just kind of watch people's conversations. You understand what they're talking about. You maybe want to start, like, there's a great graphic that you guys can look at from last week's, or two weeks ago at Ohio State or um, at Oregon. There was a, uh, there was a, uh, like, a social media big boot camp, and Esther Chu has this, 
reply that I actually tweeted out. And that's the, the evolution of a Twitter user. And it was a Cro Magnon evolution. And it starts out with like, first you like, then you retweet, then you retweet with a comment. And then ultimately you get to a point where you start generating your own content. Uh, and that's, and then you get your followers and it really is a very natural place. But you can just start reading other people's information and then you'd be surprised how much fun it is. I mean, you know, just kind of like seeing what people are talking about. If you're not familiar with Twitter, here's the anatomy of a tweet. So what are we talking about? Everyone should probably have a good avatar which describes something about who you are. Not you, an egg. Not an egg. You've got a handle. So I'm Emed Coach and hopefully you have a, a name that kind of fits in with you and then we have a feminine tweet. So your name, then also your hashtag, which might discuss a bigger topic. The hashtag for this conference is Cord AA17. So if you want to find out what's going on at Cord, you can find out by searching for that hashtag. And then your message. You can also give shouts out for other people that you want to include. If there was content produced that was worthy, you want to attribute that to the author. And then you can also put in pictures. You can put in abbreviated URLs. And it does a very good job of adding those together. Again, you can reply to a tweet. You can retweet someone to say, hey, I felt like this was an important topic that the people that I uh, influence might be influenced by. One of the things that's cool about Twitter also, and again, this is not supposed to be a Twitter workshop, but if you do get one of those infographics and you want to post it, you know, Twitter has its limitations, right? People only hear who are paying attention to what you're saying. So in a lot of ways, a lot of what you say, if you're especially new to Twitter, cannot get heard by a lot of people. But if you tag people that have large followings, then you can get a chance. If they retweet it, then it changes the kind of amplification of your message. Twitter is limited to 140 characters, right? We all know that by the current conversation around how many damage, how much damage can be caused with 140 <laughs> characters. But so basically, but if you put a picture up, you can actually tag people in the picture, and that doesn't take away from your characters. So by using an infographic as a picture, right, and then you tag people in that picture, you can actually increase the chance that people read that or see it because the picture is a kind of a vehicle to getting more people to see the tweet. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, so if you're going to get on, be bold. You've got to take a leap and you've got to jump in the water. It's going to be cold, but you're going to enjoy it once you get there. Engage in the discussion and make a comment. You all have interests. You all have specialties and you all have some knowledge that is maybe a little more focused than other people in certain aspects. So use that and become part of the conversation. And then your network can be as big as you make it. A lot of the relationships, a lot of the people that we know all started off through interactions with Twitter. We get to go to these conferences, we get to see people in, in person, and it's a great way to develop your personal learning network. So to amplify what Dara has said Hopefully we've shown you how to incorporate technology and social media into your clerkships. We've also shown you how easy it is to create free open access medical education by as simple as getting in the conversation with Twitter. So hopefully this week we want you to pay attention to the people and the leaders here and I challenge you and inspire you to go out and engage your learners beyond the classroom. On behalf of my wonderful, beautiful partner, Dara Cass, she is a wonder woman. I'm and Scott Leaders. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. All right. We're like